Hello and welcome back to the Ospreys Irie podcast, the podcast who still hasn't been given a central contract uh, and fully expect uh, a Leinster podcast to uh, start 20 minutes after us and up stages, just like they did on Monday. Uh, my name is James, as always, and I am joined uh, full house this week by the boys, uh, Yestin, Robbie, how are we? I guess yeah, I'm getting this time. Um... I'm getting the gag in early. I'm getting this gag in early. Um have Leinster got a second row that's a British and Irish lion as in the test Ooh. player as well. <laughs> on the central Ooh. contract. Oh that's other than that, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. I just wanted to get that one in really quickly because there's been a lot of Leinster chat and I haven't been involved in it this week, which is excellent. <laughs> But yeah, it feels like all the Lenser supporters are now picking other people to maybe speak to. And Munster supporters, are, are, in my opinion, are definitely chirping up a little bit about a couple of things. But that's a different story for a completely different day. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's I discovered the best way to do Twitter on Monday, which is oh, to tweet yeah. something that will cause people to bite seconds before turning your phone off to watch a film. Um, like What's I was... Film? Yeah, oh, I saw the uh, Amy Winehouse film, oh, the Back in God. Black, which is um, both not as bad as it's being made out to be, and also an evil movie that shouldn't exist, considering it's been like produced by her dad because the documentary about her made him look so bad that his yeah. dad's gone and like forced this feature through where he comes through across really well. Um, kind of evil movie, but you know, not as bad as people are saying. And I had a perfectly okay time with it. Uh, then I came out the other Ford side. Made a film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I came out the other side, had like, you know, 80 odd Leinster fans being furious with me, went, huh, um, replied to a few of them, furthering the wind up, then turned my phone off and saw a different film. And honestly, that is the ideal way to do it, is to just disappear for like a few hours in between and not really take it seriously. My favourite one who replied to you is because I follow him, but is a former Cardiff uh, Met University flanker and uh and Bedford Blues flanker, now playing mm. in Hong Kong, Charles Rylands, mm -hmm. um, who I maintained the Scarlet should have signed instead of you and Shenton, um, <clears throat> replying to you. I was like, oh, okay. This is just getting like, because it was getting weirdly personal. And Jamie said after the recording on Monday that he wished <laughs> he just never tweeted it now. I was like, yeah. don't lie, your socials are doing bits. <laughs> but this was it, like, we've been um, looking to put this World Cup final video up for quite a long time. Do the tease, and then like half an hour later, Lenter like, by the way, we signed Geordie Barrett, and mm. suddenly, you know, never mind. No attention went to that. It's fine. Um, we didn't want it anyway. What a weird day! Because they announced Dan Sheehan in the morning, right? Which is fair enough. Like mm. he's on a nice. 500 grand a year central contract like, let's, let's not be around the bush and then you thought cool can't get any better than that then they announced George Barrett and you're like okay and then weirdly with no fanfare at all they just announced Tyler Blayendahl yeah. the next day as a tap coach Stephen um, <laughs> somewhere Sky Sports have just re I've like got up like The Undertaker and I just thought 2014, 2015 is back. I know. Um, I love Tyler Blaine Doll. He's, he's one of my favorite 33. players to watch in that era. Wow. Wait, 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 hold on. 33? I'm dead certain he's only like 33. He retired due to a neck injury, I think, a few years ago. So um, I think he retired rather youngish. Wow. So he I would have been. I still haven't awful. forgiven him for nailing the match-winning penalty to beat the Ospreys in 2016. Yeah, he's 33, born in 1990. Wow. So when he was at Munster, he would have been... Because he yeah, was supposed wrong. to go to the 2015 World Cup, I'm pretty sure, mm. but got injured. Um, but no, it might not be 2015. It might be... No, it might be... no. I, for Ireland, I'm pretty sure he was supposed to be in an Ireland squad somewhere. 2019, presumably. Yeah. Oh, here we are. Um, he captained New Zealand in the 20s in the 2010 IRB Junior World Championships. Wow. Um, and then he qualified for Ireland in 2018, um, but never played, but was called up to an international camp in August 2017. 
Right, okay. Um, well, that New so, Zealand yeah. 20s team were coached by Dave Rani. I'm just looking at it right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking to see who was... Julian yeah, Surveyor was... was in the team. Um, yeah. Rory Grice, your favourite player. Um, listener, you love Rory Grice, don't you, listener? <laughs> Do you remember Rory Grice, folks? <laughs> um... The, the Wales team's interesting this year. Mm. This has been like Ben John, Aaron Jarvis, Falato. Oh, hello. Uh, I guess this is the year before Falato wins his first cap, isn't it? So It is. He's... We've got on a big tangent already. We That's have. Great. We have. This um, is an excellent tang- a tangent that James kicked yeah. off at the immediately at the start of the podcast. <laughs> and it's not even the... And now Leinster have got another piece of Central contract news because bloody after seeing you, they they clearly watched your video and decided to give him a central contract. Is James yeah. Gibson Park is getting yeah? Him, so honestly, I mean, they still must honestly, have though, like three million in the all of them, salary cap. All of them are only doing it for the month for the love for the love of it for the love of it. Yeah. They are completely unmotivated by money. They are doing it purely because they love Donny Brook and yeah, they dream they of one day. Yeah, exactly. They love um, the the bridge in the middle of Dublin. They yeah. love um, the one fish and chip shop I went to that once. They, um, they like Temple Bar. Yeah, they love how posh Big. the spas are, as in like yeah. the, the shop spa, which is weirdly upmarket. Um, they love it. They just want to stay there for that. Ross Maloney didn't love it. <laughs> no. Poor Ross Maloney, man. 29 didn't get a cap. Imagine being that good and you didn't even get a cap. If you look through the entire um, Leinster squad on Wikipedia, it looks like when you look at Ross Maloney, there's a formatting error because he's the only one not in bold. That's so gutting, man. It's genuinely like... oh, Right. Enough Leinster chat. That'll be in a couple of weeks. Um, so, yes. Uh, this Not a victory pod this week. Um, but we do have proper rugby to get back to um, in the book. Uh, let's start with news desk. Uh, Morse, Morse, Morse. How do you like it? Morse, Morse, Morse. <laughs> um, the best number, young number eight in Wales has signed a new contract. Um, never in doubt. Um, I was definitely very scared he wasn't going to sign one, even though I've known for quite a while because... <laughs> That it, it, well, it's been rumoured heavily for quite a while. Um, he has indeed signed a new deal. Um, former season ticket holder, it's always going to happen. Um, it's the things you love to see. It is, it is the things you love to see. Uh, yes, then talk, talk us through uh, Morgan Morse's new contract. Yeah, this Your was agent. The, the real, the <laughs> real news of Monday evening, really, wasn't it? Before Leinster decided to kick off and <laughs> off. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's good to see young players, you know, staying on. Obviously, we've seen that with Dan Edwards. I know Morse is staying. Luckily, he told me very early on that he was signing the new deal. <laughs> they just chat up about it, just in case someone would attack me. And I wouldn't want Morgan Morse running at me. And I wouldn't want anyone from the Ospreys running at me either. So it kind of uh, I kind of just be quiet and just left that to go on the side. And then when it was announced, obviously it took a little bit of time. But um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's all it's all good news. And um, you know, he's 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 really looking forward to it from what he was saying to me. And so yeah, mm. that's 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 another positive as well, you know. And it's a good environment at the moment and you know, despite the result last Friday night in, in Europe, it's um it's still looking rather positive. Yeah. You look at how much he's come on this season for being in this squad full time, you know, from that first game where he was getting stuck in, um, to then the first few games where he started and he was good, but he kind of fade out of games to then how involved and how much his work rate's gone up in a season. Imagine how far he can go in, you know, if we assume it's a two year contract, as most of these seem to be, um, yeah. even it's undisclosed. The imagine how far he can go in two years, by which point he'll be what, 21? Um, so probably about 12, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, by which point he'll just about have all of his milk teeth in. Just imagine how good he can be by the end of this first senior contract that he signed. Um, really exciting, really important player to keep hold of. 
you know, him and Dan Edwards and so on are the players that feel the most important to hang on to at the minute in order to make sure you've got this kind of core of young players that will definitely be there and, you know, developing, as Booth's talked about any number of times, players that have an affinity for the club and care about the club. And yeah, that is what's important. That is what's exciting, most of all. And yeah, really eager to see him playing again in 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 the coming years. He's just like watching him come through and and sort of burst onto the stage. He has so much development to do. Yeah, like you could just see it. Like that. There's times where he's probably been guilty of giving away maybe too many penalties or you know, overplaying a bit too much, maybe doing a bit too fit in, you know, things like that. But that will come with Boothism, time in the saddle. Do you know what I mean? It will come with just repetition of, you know, game time and, and things like that. And, you know, the, the, the main comparison would be to Mackenzie Martin, right? But where I feel he'll have the edge on Mackenzie Martin maybe long term is that he didn't get called into a Wales squad to sort of yeah. stunt his development. Not stunt his development's wrong, but to to not play regularly, essentially. He, mm. he didn't have a month of training away from his team. He was with Wales under-20s, but in the in the bye weeks was with Ospreys. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You know, and, and they even gave him time off from the in the 20s where he was exclusively at the Ospreys. You know, so I, I feel like it would just aid his development so, so much. Um, and I, I'm just, you know, absolutely buzzing that he's got a new deal. Yeah. It's the amazing thing about you go back to the, the start of this podcast and the way we sometimes talk about this promising youngster, Morgan Morse, who hasn't played a game yet, or, you know, after that Sharks game, had played a handful of minutes, had just played, you know, the, what, I think 12 minutes he played in that game. Um, he came on an injury replacement and then went back off, didn't he? Yeah, and then finish the game. Yeah. And then when there's that talk of him having to start against the Scarlets, um, because there were some players struggling with injuries, and that feels like a very different player to the one we've re-signed now, you know, mm. for having had these chances and having developed as a player. And it goes the same for Dan Edwards, goes the same for James Fender, goes the same for so many players, you know, Lewis Lloyd, who have come in this season and have effortlessly stepped up. And that's been the really pleasing thing this year is the way these players re-signing, how different that feels now towards the end of the season than it would have at the start. If they signed a contract immediately at the start of the season to say, Morgan, Mor- Morgan Morse has moved on to a full-time deal, um, full-time senior deal rather than the academy contract I presume he was on before. Um, yeah, feels very different now, now that he's had plenty of chances. And he would have had plenty of interest in other places. Yeah. No doubt about it. But that... In terms of rugby, that try against Cardiff went viral. Mm. Like, there wasn't a rugby account with a decent following that didn't tweet it out. I remember Jim Hamilton tweeting it out, and I'm like, whatever you think of Jim Hamilton in his podcast or whatever, um, he's still a big figure in, in this industry. Yeah. And you're like, hello, if he's tweeting it out, then it's, yeah. It, the NFL really, are probably really, calling. He's got a bit of NFL about him. They're, they're, mm. I will, he's a bit sm- probably a bit small for the NFL, if I'm honest. Um, but he's got that American football style about him. But he's just hard as nails. Um, so absolutely buzzing. Mm. Uh, second bit of news: uh, the tri- the squad have travelled out to South Africa. They are staying. Uh, in their usual base in Stellenbosch. Uh, Tom Boter, I assume, is staying at his mum's house. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I hope she has good Wi-Fi because, well, what we're about to talk about. Um, yeah, so as far as we can see, that uh, all of the Wales internationals have travelled. Mm. So Nicky, Gareth, Dewey, Jack Morgan, Adam Beard has travelled. Um Watkin. So, um, Watkin, Sam Parry has travelled. Um, some youngsters have gone out. Um, Harry Houston being one. Um, uh, in further news to that, 
I revealed yesterday that Victor Sekakete and Giandre Rudolph will rejoin the Ospreys for the two two game tour to South Africa. So again, more warm bodies. Um, as Toby has mentioned before, there is scope to go get the low knees if needed. Mm. Um, but they are not being eyed to uh, join on this tour. They're, they need to sit there. The plan is they're going to stay in uh, in Bloemfontein. Mm. Uh, that's good news. Um, what isn't good news is Tom Bota has been cited by the EPCR for... Um, a dangerous tackle that occurred in the 12th minute of the game uh, on Sev Atkinson. Now, Robbie and I were at the game, um, mm. so we couldn't really see this and didn't notice anything during the game. Uh, someone did gif it and put it on, on Twitter this morning, and it's... I don't think it's sight-worthy. <laughs> um, boys, what's your opinion on this? Um... I don't know, really. You kind of like looked at it at first. You're thinking it's just a okay double hit by Beard and Tom Botha that's just stopped Atkinson from making a break, and if not further. And it's then and looking back at it, and obviously when when the video clip was, was shown on social media early, you're thinking, how has no one picked that up? on the field is is my question and if not on the field how isn't the TMO chirped in and said oh hang on wouldn't you want a little look at this it, it just feels really weird but then again on the other hand is a tackle you know the amount of double tackles you see nowadays on a on a rugby field you know especially an assist tackle as someone coming in after maybe one person with a tackle hmm. you're thinking you know maybe that's just for some people, you know, another double tackle, which you've seen countless times throughout a game. And if you're watching a lot of games rugby over a weekend, you see it for loads of times. But it's, um yeah, so it's an interesting one. You can see why a little bit of it where maybe he might have gone up to head contact, but with the assist tackler, I, I'm not too sure, but I'm no expert in ref chat, so... Uh, I might have to answer this one. No, no, neither am I. I am um, not a ref chat expert. I also haven't seen the tackle. Um, I've been just looking for it and I can't find it. I mean, I'll I didn't see the tackle, you but you know, it's probably at a, a yeah. weaker angle. Um, I didn't notice anything obviously dangerous. But yeah, um, you didn't feel like anything stood out. And it was a bit of a surprise to see that news come in. He does feel like a player who probably needs a bit of a rest. So, um, you, obviously, it's not the way you want anyone to be suspended, but he has played basically every single game for the Ospreys this season. And yeah, that that looks pretty regulation. And it does slip high. It looks like one where if it gets reviewed, the team has probably got no choice but to give a penalty. Just glancing at it now. But yeah, surprised, as you'd say, that's maybe been um, cited, but also, you know, you've got to go through the correct procedures it does slip high no um, i agree with the procedures bit what what is just double standard is what's not been cited this weekend yeah which is the big one which is jack yendall's eye gauge mm. which you know and if that's getting cited then i yeah so for me um i i i, I i'd like to think this isn't going to get taken any further mm. um but we'll see We'll see. Um, our final bit of news, well, it's more news, but more um, predictions. Alex Cuthbert on the Scrum 5 podcast did say that Jack and Dewey might not play, or he thinks they won't play. Um, they have flown out with the squad, um, but it may be a case of getting them more time on grass, getting them some of those warm weather rehab as well. Um is the aim to get them in in the Welsh derbies, or is it Leinster away? Do we like to continue, you know, to redo his heroic turnover in the seventy ninth minute, like in Leinster away in twenty twenty one? Um, it, it's a lottery. I'm of the opinion they might play, mm. um, simply because of, I was sat next to them on Friday, um, <laughs> and they, they, they looked raring to go. Um, yeah. 
it did at one point look like I followed Jack Morgan into the toilets. I didn't, I promise. Um, we were just both going the same way. And then the, st- the steward let him back to his seat, but not me. He said, oh. you got to wait for a break in play. I'm like, um, okay. In fairness, you're not the Wales captain. And I think that does allow certain privileges. True, but still, double standards, man. This is supposed to be a working mm. class town. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just as working class as the come talk about. Um, so yeah, yeah. The Other than that, the on. impression I've got is that um, Jack is closer to return from injury than Dewey, um, but this isn't well sourced. Um, I definitely wouldn't be expecting to see Dewey Lake, you know, on the bench or starting this weekend. Where I think Jack Morgan's got an outside chance of playing this week. And wouldn't be surprised if he features the week after. Um, having had a you know that brief chat to him uh, before the Munster game, he seemed quite happy that he was close to returning, and you know said he was close to playing. And again, having had, yeah, Dewey Lake from again having walked past him a couple of times recently, he looks all right. He looks fine. Whether that means he can play eighty minutes or even twenty minutes is a different matter. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how they're each getting on. You trust this medical staff and the coaches to assess them properly. And it'd be great to have them back as a boost. Would have been perfect. They could have come back in time for the um, the Gloucester game. But mm-hmm. alas, wasn't to be. Thankfully, we've still got something to play for in the closest stage of the season as they hopefully run out again. I wonder who else might have gone out. Will mm. Griff, maybe? He was looking quite spry. Mm. Um, well, um, I'm not sure about the Fender. So I I heard um, James Friend who is apparently there or thereabouts was the phrase used. So apparently he's you close to returning. <laughs> uh, no, no, apparently this is from Toby Booth. This is a um, apparently Booth has said as much that Fender is very close to return. Um, that would be that would be nice. So yeah, give poor that'd be good. Rest. Yeah, and his injury, I think, was said to be maybe like six weeks at the time, and it's been seven or eight, so yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, Perpignan, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah. Cool. So that was news, pretty light on news this week. Um, right, let's talk about the day first rather than the game, because we were both there. Mm. Um, yes, and unfortunately couldn't make it, so you're, you're going to have to talk about Espadour X, uh, uh, input. Who I walked past Rhys Priestland and Lynn Jones many times uh, that evening. Um, so Robbie, talk us hmm. through your you know your version of the day and how weird it kept getting weirder and weirder. Yeah, I mean, I yes, I don't know how you go to so many games. I've been to one like the last five weekends in a row, and I feel knackered from having done all the travel. Um, I don't know how I do it either because um, <laughs> I I covered the uh, cup finals a couple of weeks ago and that was three games in one day. Oh wow, a lot of, co- yeah. lot of coffee. Um, well, I don't really do hot drinks, so it was kind mm. of like water. But there was free food provided, so it kind of you know balanced it out, I suppose. But um, yeah, I don't know how I watch so much rugby, especially attending games. If I'm being brutal, yeah. Young. But um, yeah, I I find a way, I suppose. If you, want to, <laughs> if you want to use use a boothism, um, but um, yeah, sadly I couldn't make it Friday night. But um, yeah, I'm not going to South Africa, so there's a nice little, <laughs> there's a nice little break over the next few weeks. So uh, you know, I'll enjoy the downtime and watching the games on the TV instead. Let's go to Leinster. Let's all go to Dublin. We'll go to the RDS. I might get personally oh. attacked by British and Irish Lions uh, claims. Yeah. <laughs> at, at so Gordon Shea is going to hunt you down. <laughs> he probably I'm... had them ready. That's my worry. <laughs> no, I'm um, at a rugby club tomorrow, a professional team, um, which almost counts. And then Wales women the following week for the Italy game. Um, so I feel like I've, I've kind of, I should just travel over to Dublin the following week and watch the Ospreys there. Um, all go to Eurovision, same event, you know, same night. Um, same but yeah, night. it's 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 a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, Gloucester, I think, was 
one of the biggest grounds to visit on my kind of rugby bucket list that I mm. hadn't been to. And I'm so glad to have ticked that off now. It was everything I hoped for and an absolutely glorious place to go. Result aside, um, it's a really unique and different atmosphere to almost any other premiership ground. Mm. Um, you can tell, as you mentioned earlier, but that fixture between the Ospreys and Gloucester is really rare within rugby, especially in the UK. In the and especially Anglo Welsh fixtures in particular, um, where it adds that kind of spice of an Anglo Welsh game. In the it is two towns where rugby is a working class game, and you had two working class sets of fans, and so it was the closest to a kind of football the atmosphere, I think, and two sets of fans that were really chanting and singing and going for each other, but tongue in cheek, and there was no kind of animosity, but there was, you know, there was a few like times where a group of Gloucester fans would start a chant that was anti-Ospreys, you know, bantery stuff, and then there'd be a counter chant starting following. And it was a really different vibe to trips to Leicester or Saracens or so on, where you kind of had two very different ways of watching a game clashing. A of, uh, it's a lot of golf claps and well yeah. chat. I must have mentioned it on here, the Saracens fan who told um, a load of Ospreys fans to stop singing because they were annoying him <laughs> during a game. Um, but you kind of had yeah two teams with quite similar approaches um coming up against each other and it's fantastic as an atmosphere and the whole day leading in an awful lot of ospreys fans traveled over i think the figure was around 900 they said um which is great and to say they sold about nine nine hundred nine thousand tickets about 10 percent traveling support isn't bad at all but yeah um really exciting phenomenal day and Gloucester's a lovely town with a brilliant stadium and they do so much around it to build that atmosphere. Yeah, so I travelled up from South West London, um, documented my travels on the Twitter account, <laughs> which, uh, which you know, gave, got some chuckles out of people, uh, especially going to Sale Place um, and Gloucester Place. Um, yeah, so we arrived at Kingsham and I, I went and met Robbie and um, mm. So if you know, the Osprey sort of arranged for a bar um, to, to sort of host us, Lance Bradley's which is bar. Lance Bradley's bar, yeah. Um, uh, and it was brilliant. They were lovely. <laughs> they were super nice. It was a lovely location down at the Keys. They even put on like a, our own beer um, called Twin Town with our logo on it. And it was lovely. Um, huge thank you to everyone that sort of came over and said hi. Uh to, to Robbie mainly, but you know, you know who you are. <laughs> him, saw me as well. Um, no, there were uh, a lot of listeners who came over and said hi, yeah. and you know, um, mentioned the listen great, podcast. Great to chat with uh, Grant from Supporters Club mm. um, as well uh, about some stuff. It was Grant, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, Lance, uh, all the Osprey staff were there as well. You know, so oh, you, really great. You properly moseyed in and had a chat with Lance. Proper schmoozing. I just said hi and just said, you know, keep 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 us keep our name out there. You know what I mean? I'm just trying <laughs> to keep the podcast relevant. You know, apologies for apologies for keeping us going. <laughs> Got to pay the rent somehow. Um, God damn, bloody Scarlett and Scott Sneddon on this week. So I'm gonna have to go find like a random academy coach now. Um. The problem is it's yeah. Paul James, isn't it? Yeah, shit. Um, who was the other one? James Hawk. <laughs> oh fuck. Who like I have history with. We can't yeah. we can't we let can't that happen again. That. Um damn it. I can just not turn up that week, so yes, he can right. take it on his own. Rich Kelly, get in you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so uh yeah, then we so we marched over to the to the ground. Um we Went to the the tunnel in which like the players enter, um, where we met up with Carwin uh, from the kind of Central podcast, um, who was a proper fancy journalist who was there with Sport in mm-hmm. Wales. So I had a really nice chat with him. Lawrence Delalio walked into the press box and, and yeah. I shit you know everyone booed him, like <laughs> Gloucester great. and Ospreys fans just like boos and there was like one show to wanker. Um, <laughs> Which might have been one from the Gloucester staff. I don't know. Hey, no, um, I have it on good authority. Wanking is not his thing. He has more expensive <laughs> ways of dealing with that yeah, situation. True. Um, 
Yeah, so that was great. Um, it was the the Welsh press had clearly travelled up because there was mm. like Yo and Dyer was there, um, I think Ben James was there. There was, there was you know a good few of them there. Um, great. The the all of the Ospreys fans sort of welcomed this team in, um, and then booed the Gloucester team coming in. <laughs> um, so it had. Um, Toby walking on his own separately as well, not through yeah. the tunnel that had been formed, just round He's the back, so you know, trying to get through the media entrance. Yeah. Word got um, out, he was walking by, and he got the biggest cheer of the day. So, th- the best part of this bit, though, so, a disclaimer, as I've told, told many times, I grifted my way into some tickets um, from Jamal Ford Robinson, and we met him beforehand to pick up said tickets. So we met and had a chat, and and various things and discussing some stuff, having a catch up because it's been a while. And then he said, Right, I've got to go, I've got to go do some pre match stuff. And I thought, Right, they've already been in the stadium, he's got to go get strapped in bed or something like that, you know, rugby thing. No, he had to go, go out onto this industrial estate to get on the team bus to then get off the team bus to walk down the tunnel to no Gloucester fans because all the Ospreys fans were there instead. So. <laughs> That was uh, that was a uh, very because it was only us who knew what was happening. I was like, yeah, he's just got on that bus like two minutes ago. <laughs> Probably not even sat down. Um, yeah, so we went into the stadium. Then it was you know the atmosphere was building really nicely. Um, yeah, it's a great travelers for a lot of young you know young fans, you know, kids with their parents, but also then like that twenties to you know, eighteen to thirty five range. Um, yeah, uh, so we uh, we went with myself, uh, my Robbie, my mate uh, James, and Hugh Griffin from Scarlet Fees Run Pirate Rugby Pod. Um, who oh, bless him got outed as a Turk straight away, um, by drop goal hero, um, uh, what's his name, the little one, Roger, uh, Roger, and his dad. Uh, outed him as a Turk straight away. So shout out to Tony and Rodri. Um and the chance he's a Turk uh were, were thrown at him. But he took it in his stride. Mm. Um took it in his black cap. Yeah, took it in his flat cap. Um but yeah Kingston was definitely one of them ones I needed to tick off my bucket list. Mm. Um so we made our way to our seats and so Robbie you were sat um you were sat yeah, right so- by the Right in the corner where Gloucester scored, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah right in, right down, maybe 10 metres out from the line. Um, okay. Right down the front, maybe third row back. In amongst, so, you know, obviously we all had the option to go in the shed. Um, and I, I don't think it's, I'm not too big to admit I was scared. I was scared <laughs> to be on my own in the shed, um, just like I was with my dad. And seeing then where I ended up, which was sat next to a five-year-old girl at her first rugby game while her dad tried to explain what out on the full meant, was a very different experience to how I'd imagined a first trip to Gloucester, where I'm the one minding my language, was, um, yeah, a a very, very different experience. We had a slightly different one. Uh, so we are obviously got kind of... We got our tickets and we're at, so we're in the friends and family bit of Gloucester. So to my right was Gavin Hastings, um, who gave me the most deadpan evil look when I shouted way when Adam did something wrong during the game. <laughs> um, in front of us, I'm convinced, was Adrian Varney. Oh, wow. Which is Stephen's dad and future niece Hall of Famer. Probably done a cameo for them as well. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he actually has. Um, and then we had like uh, Matthias Alamano, um, oh, one of the Gloucester Academy lads who I was chatting with, who's really good at under twenties. Uh, I tell you now, Josh Hathaway. He was there, but he wasn't sat. Um, okay, I in... um, lent lent again at the chair he was sitting on, and he got um, he gave a look of <laughs> slight annoyance you, when you I moved did, the chair. You did get that yeah. did happen. That. <laughs> that's going to be one day when he's playing international rugby 
that's going to be one of my anecdotes. I go, oh, well, I once mildly annoyed him while he was sitting on a chair. Oh, Afalasi uh, Fasogbon, I think that's what you say. The, the England of the 20s prop, uh, who was at Irish and then now over Gloucester. Very, very good player. Um, hmm. uh, he was there, and then to our left was sat all the Ospreys contingent that travelled after we were playing. So it was Liam Edwards, uh, Will Griff, Jack, dare we, Yeston Hopkins in his moon boot, and one, maybe one more. Um, but they travelled there. It's obviously seen the, the, the team and there was a splattering of other players and stuff around. So, yeah, it was really good. And then the end of the game happened and we sort of got separated from Robbie um, mm. as we went down to sort of see Jamal. I went to say thank you. I said, what's happening? And then we got invited over to Teague's. Now, Teague's is a pub opposite the stadium, like literally directly opposite, which is owned and operated by Mike Teague. Um mm. So I texted Robbie, I said, do you fancy coming? Um, and we came over and we got chat with some lovely Gloucester fans, um, had some great conversation with some very drunk Ospreys fans, um, shout out Harry and the boys, um, who, who were great. And then we started drinking. Well, we weren't really drinking. We had that sort of one beer with um, Joel Ford Robinson and Lewis yeah. Ledlow and a load of Academy lads. Um, and then Mike T came over and said hi to, to yeah. everyone. <laughs> and we were like, if we were all you know, going home and it was incredibly tired, yeah, I'd let you buy us drinks, Mike Teague. <laughs> um, but it, it was just a year. It, the, the night, it started weird and it ended weird. Like, I in think the best way, though. I think that's fair to say, yeah. And then we had an incredibly inebriated Gloucester fan follow us through the centre of yes! Gloucester where we were walking back to our car and you were walking back to a hotel. Yeah, and he just shouting, kept shouting like daffodils at us. Daffodils, because <laughs> I think it started oh. fairly aggressive. You know, it was just sort of a get out of our town, you lost, and then yeah. he just followed us through town, yelling the word daffodils over and over again, which is shit banter. Fair play to him. It was awful banter. All right, what I will say is the the individuals who I met, their banter mm. was particularly awful. <laughs> um, Gloucester do not like you booing the kicker as well. Oh, They're yeah, yeah, really yeah. big on rugby values. Um, it was, yeah. There were a few Gloucester fan accounts that tweeted about how great the Ospreys fans were. Yes. Jamal mentioned afterwards was that they were maybe the best away fans he'd experienced at King's Home, which was amazing. And it was loud and it was different. And, you know, having spoken to a few people who watched it on TV, said the same thing. Um, that it really came across how much more level than normal the atmosphere was at King's Home. Um but there was apparently one Ospreys fan who booed a kicker at one point. And yeah. so if you read any of those Gloucester fans, it's always possible. Well, there was one who booed the kicker. So therefore the other 800 are invalid completely. Yeah, they're scum. Yeah. The <laughs> lowest was, of the it? low. Genuinely, that rugby Gloucester kick, who was a lovely guy, by the way, mm. like tweeted back and forth to him. Like tweeted saying, oh, these, the, the Ospreys fans were brilliant. You know, they, they sung all night. They out sung the shed. Um, you know, which doesn't happen. Uh, and then one man basically called us like Hitler's children because, you know, one of mm. us had the audacity to boo Santi Carreras. Um, and I was like, geez, you, you've you never survived like a, a French second league game, would you? <laughs> well, most of the French second division crowd is just yelling at the touch judge that the kick was further along that way and you should get an extra five metres off a penalty. Is what I learned. That's the crowd's role. There's a lot of similarities done. to the French second division and the Welsh, like, East Central five. <laughs> I, I bet there is. No, the, the, French, the French second division seems like a perfect league for me to go to and watch next season. Especially if they're going to all you know, just shout to the touch judge to move up a few metres. I'm, I'm all <laughs> over it. If someone could sort of work placements for me or any pro de club, please give me a shout because... Is there I'll a French EDC? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sam Lana will be right on that. <laughs> oh my God, I'd pay to watch you and Sam Lana go on a road trip to just different French pro de clubs. Genuinely a great idea. <laughs> That's the- <laughs> You could even like top I... off for the weekend, like watching, I don't know, Toulouse, you know, if DuPont was playing somewhere. Ooh. Just like top off the weekend, thinking there's like one end of the scene. 
a massive scrap in the pro D uh, to the other end, just seeing Andrew, Andrew Pont like put in the chip and chase and beat like seven defenders <laughs> just for me to try. I think so, it, I... I think it's a brilliant idea. I think it's a great idea. And like so are you all both so okay, here's a here's an anecdote. I'm not sure if I've told publicly before, but um a few years back, someone from World Rugby got in touch with me after I'd done a bunch of stuff in the pandemic, um, about doing in the lead up to the World Cup a show called Tour de Rugby, where I would go around France and the venues of the World Cup and do like a yeah, like a travel blog thing where they take me around and they do the stuff. And they were pitching it to a bunch of different places. They're pitching to like YouTube originals. They're pitching to a few like online um, broadcasters, potentially World Rugby's YouTube channel as well. And they kind of had this idea. They had to get a package ready to go, and they had a pitch document. And I saw it all, and I saw all the, um, you know, the, the the powerpoints and the slides and everything put together with me attached as the as the host. I'd go around and do it, and. Um, it just sort of rolled on over maybe two years or something. Every now and again, every few months, I'd get like a, an email or a text from the producer saying, we're still working on this thing. We're pitching it to a new place this weekend. Are you still available for it? I was like, yeah, sure. Grand, you know, whatever. Um, and then, you know, a year passed and I don't hear anything about it. And I figure, oh, I guess it fell apart. I guess nothing came of it. I, you know, I hadn't heard from the, the producer in a while. Um, and then about, <laughs> about a month before the World Cup, I... I'm casually scrolling through Twitter when I see a trailer drop for Tour de Rugby with Taika Waititi. Yeah. And I I looked it up and it is produced by the same people. It is the same show that they wanted me for. But but now with Taika Waititi instead of me. And Brilliant. I mean, look, I don't know how to take it whether the fact they clearly couldn't get the money then the moment they got Tyker on board, they dropped me like a stone and didn't even tell me. Or the fact that I was first choice above Oscar-winning filmmaker Taika Waititi. Um, that is something I have lived with for a uh, better part of a year now. That's brilliant. That is genuinely a fantastic anecdote. Uh, <laughs> sorry, when we were picturing um, Prodi it and like bottom tier French clubs. I was like trying to think of ra like random players who play for these teams. So I was like, right, I can't wait to go watch Evan Olmstead play for Oh, Argentina. Good player. Good player. Um against like you could have you could have the Canadian derby of uh Cast versus Argent. It's 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 uh, <laughs> Ardron versus Ardron and Evan Olmstead. Oh. Um Grenoble have just signed Gershwin Mouton, the Namibia winger who was great oh. in the World Cup. I'm so yes. glad to see him get a club. Who else? Arjun have signed Santi Cecino from Gloucester as well. Oh, nice. Okay. That'd be, yeah. I, I I know it's bad for rugby, right? That we're hemorrhaging our players too. We're like Irish doctors, right? We're just going off to places we shouldn't. Um, but it is funny to see who Pro D to let her just sign in. Mm. And it also yeah. allows so many players who couldn't get contracts elsewhere. And yeah. particularly tier two players, like so many of the Romania and Georgia and so on squads play in the Pro Leader. You know, Portugal's basically an entire team's in the Pro Leader. And it allows a competitive, strong level of rugby for those players. And Sam Davis. And Sam Davis. Yeah. Ross Moriarty. Um, I was about to look at something, but it's yeah. Thomas Zazana <laughs> at Montaban. Oh yes, he's he yeah, he's the, I think he's the one. Like if you're, <laughs> he joined and everyone's like, "Ooh, hello, <laughs> this guy looks good," and then he was at Montauban within like a year and a bit. So okay, should we talk about the game? We've been off long enough. Sure, we won't spend too long on it. Um, right, yes, then you watched it. You watched it on TV. Talk to us how it, how how did it look from the telly? I was a bit nervy to begin with. Especially when the set the set piece started to falter, hmm. and then all of a sudden Jack Walsh makes a break and sets up a try, and you're thinking, right, it was a little bit shaky, but that's a really, really good first fifteen minutes. Then obviously the career is kicked back, kicked back into a point behind, and then when they thought when they defended the first rule in Morley, thought right, that's okay, just make sure you exit and nothing silly happens. Then you give away mm. a penalty, they go into the corner, they score from the next mall, and you're thinking, 
that might not have been the plan, but there's still a long, long time to go. Then you narrow the scores down a little bit with the penalty before half time. You're thinking, do you know what? There's still a sniff here. They haven't played particularly well, but they're still, you know, they don't do anything really, really bad in the second half. You, you're thinking, right, this, this is a game to be had. Then you just, it just felt like it was just a little bit of overplaying around halfway. That's where I kind of felt like. And as much as everyone loves Jack Walsh for the first line brick, which sets up a try, mm. the one he gave away at the start of the second half was a yeah. little bit of a killer. And you thought, ah, that might not work again. And um, one of the the, the niche things I, I found from, from Friday was the box kicks, where, you know, Ruben Morgan Williams was sticking up in the air and they were all fine. Well, the majority of them were fine. But Gloucester had about three or four players just shielding whoever mm. was backfield just to just to catch the thing and I'm still waiting for World Rugby to probably make a tweak on this in the near future because mm. if you saw because a couple of images you see sometimes four maybe five places like shielding around and most teams do it and it's kind of like awful common, common practice it's nowadays genuinely yeah. awful so you see the the Gloucester do it with like three or four players do it and you see the Ospreys players do it you might have one chasing back either the winger where the oh, and then the back free player then is is normally coming in to take it and you kind of just felt like that was the difference, and it felt like the first ten or so minutes in the second half, Stephen Varney really kicked on, yeah. and I think some of his box kicks, especially during the second half, were were really good, and that was kind of like the the slight difference which kind of got them over the line, except for the set piece which was weirdly misfiring, which is not an Ospreys thing to do at all, yeah. It was what Booth said post-match, that it was a very un performance. And I think that was the disappointing thing. You know, he said that it was exactly the phrase, I think, perfectly summed it up and I wanted to hear, in that they gave the level of effort they looked for, but they didn't show what they're about. And that was the disappointing thing. Because I do think it was one of the weaker performances of the season. Um, obviously, Montpellier is a kind of outlier where they threw a lot of young players in last second and, you know, a lot didn't go right there. But, yeah, it was a frustrating game. Um, as you say, you felt like the first 20 minutes wasn't great. Then Jack Walsh makes that break and Keelan Jarrell scores that try and you feel like things have settled down and that's the moment given and, you know, they can kind of kick on from there. And it didn't quite happen. There was an awful lot of... Perhaps, again, something that Booth talked about a lot is big moments, is winning the big moments. There are a few moments where you felt like they did win those big moments and then instantly made a mistake and it slipped up and slipped away from them. Uh, the most notable being the um, Justin Tipperick mall turnover immediately before the try. The Ospreys win possession, win a scrum, and then a penalty is given against them at the scrum. And I, you know, couldn't comment on what happened. Um, Same here. But, but, it felt an awful lot like that they didn't adapt the referee at all. The referee didn't like what the Ospreys were doing and they didn't change the breakdown or the set piece in order to fit to how the referee ran. And obviously they only get a few days to do that, but they still do find out the referee on the Monday and are able to adapt to that. And then during a game, you can make tweaks and you can go, okay, this guy's really hot on this tonight or that tonight. And they weren't doing that and they weren't adapting to that quickly enough. Um, and so, yeah, if they even just clear their lines and get up to the 22, that's a very different situation, um, even if they don't win the penalty of that scrum, to conceding a penalty, also going for the corner again, scoring that try. And then you get into the last 10 minutes, and maybe there's only three points or five points in it. And again, it's very, very different. Um, I think the other big moment was in the same corner, where the penalty with which Owen Williams hit the post was a moment that was right in front of me, Gloucester looked out on their feet and looked um, quietly delighted when when they went for the posts, when the tee came on. Yeah. And that felt like a moment from, again, being right in front of it. And admittedly, you know, even from the sideline, you can't read the energy on the field in the same way the players and the captain can. But that felt like the moment to go for the kill and go for the corner and perhaps try and look for that try to get back ahead rather than narrowing the gap to one point. Um, that, for me, felt like the big turning point because he then hits the post, glossy clear down the field, and suddenly they've got the ball in 22 instead of it being three points. It's, yeah. you know, zero points and glossy possession just outside the 22. 
And I wonder whether that was the moment where they need to be ruthless rather than patient. And that patience has got them awfully long way this season. And it's perhaps finding out of moments to put the foot on the throat and work out when that's coming. And that's something teams only gain with time and with experience. And like you look at it, it was something that the 2019 Wales team were really, really good at was knowing when to wait and take the points and when to know this is it actually now we go and now we switch on. And, yeah. you know, you saw that against South Africa in the World Cup quarterfinal, uh, semi-final rather. You saw that, you know, um, the England game in the Six Nations. You saw it, you know, any number of times. And it's something this Ospreys team will hopefully develop. But yeah, didn't feel like it was there yet. There was a lot of... um a lot of themes that have perhaps been mildly worrying this season that just didn't click. And then there were things that have been really, really good this season that just didn't click in the same way. And it was a, a frustrating, difficult game, but one I think this team will learn from once they've managed to get over it, because it's going to be a huge emotional blow for this side, as we've talked about post-match. I, I got, there's not much more to say, really. Like mm. it, it, it was a shit game. <laughs> and Gloucester were just slightly less shit. Yeah. Like, as games of rugby have gone, that is one of the poorest I've watched. Like, Gloucester didn't offer anything. Like, mm-hmm. let's not act, let's not put them on a pedestal in here and say that they offered, that like they played sexy, expansive rugby or they threatened the line in open play. They didn't. They were poor. Mm-hmm. You know, Max Llewellyn, yeah, he carried well, but ultimately, they didn't get anything for open play. But like they kept going for... The reason that Ant Santa Carreras kicked, what was it, 18 points or whatever, mm. was because they were getting nothing going off the mall. They couldn't drive... Apart from the one try, they couldn't drive it in. And then they get, they spread the ball out into midfield and it would get turned over. Um, I very much... I, I, it's not that I um, are blaming the referee, but I, I do think you put a different referee in there. He may be scr- uh, referee to scrum a bit differently. Uh, the breakdown was a bit of a mess, if I'm honest. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm not. You know. You know, curious French referees and things like that. You know, we had some. We had some really good chats with um, with Ospreys fans and Gloucester fans who were all pretty much of the, had that same opinion. Mm. Was this game could have gone either way, um, and you know we're talking here about ten point loss. That's not a that's not a big loss at all. Yeah, that you know. So look, I'm I'm happy. And Josh Gardner pointing out on Blood and Mud that this Gloucester team have had a lot more time off than the Ospreys have. Yeah. Um, and I was explaining to Hugh Griffin, I was like, just. Even though we've used the most players this season, Byron Leinster, the core of this squad have been together and played together a long, long time. Yeah. So yeah, gutting, absolutely gutting. Of course I am. I, I'm good. I'm hashtag proud of the team, like like of Cardiff. Um, you know, there's. I still have question marks over Owen Williams. Um, mm. he didn't have his best game Sam, Sam Parry I love Sam Parry right but he you know, he'll know himself that that wasn't his standard yeah. um, I thought Morgan Morse was brilliant when he came on um, you know it, it was I, probably from an Oscar's point of view really difficult to to come on and make a difference to that game yeah Um. I thought Jack Walsh went really well. I'm really impressed with him. And he's he's starting to turn heads a bit now. Philip Tetia uh said on Scrum Five. She, you know, big fan of him. Cuthbert, you know, talked about how when they were at Exeter, he was always in the, the second team and would just carve the first team up. And you can see that. Um there's been lots of um comments on the Exeter fan pages. Um in which they talk about uh, wanting Jack Walsh back <laughs> and things like that. So I think it's brilliant. And, you know, Giles, we know Giles can finish like that. And I think it was a really, really good finish by Giles. Mm. Um, yeah, so absolutely gutted, mm. but, you know, but it, I'm glad we got the monkey off our back. Yeah. 
And I feel like if we end up in the Challenge Cup next year, there's a real chance we can do something similar and be consistent in that cup run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with hopefully, you know, as Bruce talked about, hoping to have a stronger squad next season, having a few more players yeah. to rotate, not having a World Cup hangover for a few players. You know, if Adam Beard and so on can come back fresh and again, hopefully you don't have, you know, a career ending injury to like a George North or so on leading you no centers available. Uh, yeah. There's there's a lot that can be done. Um and yeah, chance to kick on next season. Mm. Should we put that game to bed? Yeah. Dead and buried. Yeah, it's ancient history now, isn't it? That's what ancient history, that's <laughs> what we said. So, I did also buy um, a lot of mascot in the club shop. The little like very disappointing guy, club shop, which I thought was all right. Um, it was a shed a lo- with some fake grass in it. Yeah, which is <laughs> had, you know. But they had a pleasing number of items in the sale to say we're still quite way off the end of the season. Yeah, they they clearly are sick of their anniversary now and have just put all that stuff up for sale. <laughs> yeah. Um, no sales who we played last week. It was Glass. Yeah, true. Sorry. Um, Keelan Giles is a bonus factoid for you, right? Because uh, I've now got an app, a note where I keep track of this. Uh, two tries behind Tommy Bow, three tries behind Sam Parry on the Ospreys' top try scores list. <laughs> He's moving up. He's moving up because Sam Parry is now above Tommy Bow. Keelan's in sixth place. Tommy Bow still looks like he'd come out of retirement. He, he, he'd probably come out yeah. from school more. Or you could um, at least, like, I reckon Keelan could do a feature on Island AM if they want to swap places. If he, he could if, learn to roller skate or something. If Tommy Bow coincidentally lands himself out in South Africa next weekend and the Ospreys hit an injury crisis. Mike Phillips it, style. It wouldn't It wouldn't surprise me that he'd come on and score a brace in, like, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, like Mike Phillips to circa 2017. Just... Yeah, just so weird. Like Mike Phillips and Hersel Yankees <laughs> coming into the because the Scarlets ran out of scrum halves. How what a weird heart, you know, contrast of two nines. This is if, if Scarlet Fever ever want to borrow a good player, I will appear on that podcast to facilitate that game in particular <laughs> because yes. it is like folklore. So, speaking of good player, mm. um. We were thinking what, what I was thinking what we could do. So we put some out. We we've looked at a couple of the cheaters games before and different squads around there. So we were like, right, maybe look at specific South African players. We talked about Marvin Ori, maybe, but that's a depressing season. I don't want to think about it. Uh JJ Engelbrecht. Um who else do we talk about? Ricky um, January. Ricky January, yeah. So then we were like, actually, and so I, I then, I was like, oh my god, Stefan Watermeyer. So I found when one of the great Stefan Watermeyer's debut. So today on Good Player, we are going to be looking at the Newport Gwent Dragons. Hello, this is the Ospreys from the twenty seventh of January, twenty twelve, which was a Friday night kickoff at the Morgan Stone Brewery Field. I remember this game way too fondly. Was it a midweek game? Was it like a Wednesday night game? No, Friday night. Right, it was a Friday night, okay. Because I remember uh, Stefan Watermeyer tweeting this was the most nervous he'd been for a game since his professional debut. Um, I remember being weirdly very excited during the school day for this game. I think because it was, you know, big Welsh derby, I think it promised to be high scoring. And yeah, was very up for it. So... Let's do what I always do, and let's look at the um, let's look at the charts that day. Mm. <laughs> so let's look first at the, the singles charts. So at number one was Domino by Jesse J. Not a good start. Uh, Mama do the hump by Rizzle Kicks. Who I actually really like Rizzle Kicks. Um, I'm glad. Fun fact. One of them appeared in a Star Wars film. Really? Um, Were they a stormtrooper yeah, or something? No, he was in. He was actually a named character in Rogue One. Oh um, well. They also did the uh, remix of the Shaun the Sheep theme tune for the Shaun the Sheep movie, which is what I think of when I think of Rizzle Kicks. <laughs> uh, you also had like uh, levels by Avicii was in here. 
Paradise by Coldplay. Uh, Kelly Clarkson was here with Stronger. This um, is a strong era. Yeah. Sexy I Know It by LMFAO. Oh, man. You did have video games by Lana Del Rey. Uh, really? This was in there. Good song. Mm. Um, Somebody That I Used to Know by Goatia and Kimbra before they both disappeared. Um, so, yeah. Rough, rough time for uh, music. In the film chart... Ooh. Got me off the right one. So let me go all the way back to 2012, January. Oh, it's done again. So I can't get the film shut up because my app's not working. So we'll go straight into the team lineup. So do you want the dragons or do you want the Ospreys first? Because both are start... equally entertaining. Should we start with the dragons? Yeah, it's normally okay. a way team goes first, isn't it? That's the okay. So. On the Dragons, starting at uh, loose head, Phil Price. Oh, yes. Good player. Good player. Uh, in Just hooker, about a good player. Who do you think was that hooker? Sam Parry? It was Sam Parry. Young Sam Parry. Young Sam Parry. Probably had an Osprey's jersey underneath his Dragons one because <laughs> he was fuming. Um, so, yeah, young Sam Parry. Then you had uh, at three was Dan Way. Dan Way. Dan Way was, yeah, I remember Dan Way. He had um, like very like tall ginger hair, sort of like a Bubsy Conan O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah. Um, end of his career at Newport Saracens. Um, <laughs> then so then you had Royce Cadman. I have no idea of that man. So, so when I first heard Royce Cadman, I'm like, if you're not like a 60 cat Canadian international, then what is the point? But he's <laughs> not, he's from, he's, he, he, he plays for Doncaster and Bedwest and twice for the Dragons, which is wow. disappointing. And then you had Javon Groves. Javon Groves, yeah. good player. Javon Groves, Greatly yeah. underrated. Like, was a um, sevens playing second row? who really? was the sort of player that when I was, what would I have been here, like 12, loved because, you know, he was a really athletic, dynamic, um, yeah, lock. But oh, I remember then, him. Yeah. Played for Cardiff a bit as well, I think. Played for Hong then, Kong. Really? He's now, he's now working in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. But yeah, just like one of those players that when you're a kid, you rate very highly and you don't know why it's a pick more. Then I haven't, you know, I haven't watched him recently, but I imagine as an adult, you'd probably be like, oh, because he, he didn't he didn't hit any rucks. Zach Mercer effect. He coaches the Hong Kong Sevens team, I think. He posted on LinkedIn six day, uh, three days ago mm. um, with something, but he seems like a LinkedIn wanker. So I'm instantly turned off. Uh, so yeah, Jevin Groves. Then moving into the back row, you had Hugo Ellis. Yeah, vague memories of playing for the Dragons. Um, he uh, had a brother, he, didn't he? he was Andy like Ellis. More. Andy Ellis. Yeah, because if he was a um, this he this guy was a um, he was a, yeah, they're both England um, sort of mm. age grade players. Obviously, Andy Ellis played a bit more. Uh, Darren Waters. Darren Wall, again, vague memories of, yeah. Played 17 times for the Dragons. J- Jamie will be listening to this now and be like, yeah, good players. Great players. Uh, and then at eight was Yayan Jones. Good player. Played for the Ospreys as well. And Cardiff. Yes, played for Cardiff. That was definitely at Neath. But uh, yeah, pretty sure played for the Ospreys as well. Um, so yeah, that was his pack. So... Some some you know good players in that pack, I think. Yeah. Um so then we move into that's a half. good pack in a very second choice of the dragons in the 2010s kind of way. Yeah, and they were already scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. You had Joe Bedford at Scrum Half, played like had a really interesting um career trajectory where it started the Doncaster Knights, Pontypool, Rotherham, Yorkshire. Saracens, Sail Sharks, and the Dragons as well. Like he's really done. He really like hates standard of living, doesn't he? That's one weird, <laughs> weird process of going through. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so then you had Stephen Jones at 10. No yeah. memory of. Yeah, yeah, no, Steph, I remember Steph Jones. He was good. Um, Had like Jay from the in-between his hair. Had okay. a big breakthrough where there was a game between the Dragons and Cardiff. They got called off for a frozen pitch or something. Um, then rearranged, and he came in to make his first play his first game of professional rugby at fullback and scored a try from doing an outrageous like dummy reverse flick um and went straight through and scored in the corner on you know maybe five, ten minutes in. And Dragons fans anointed him as the future man who shall one day rule the world. And he was okay. And in the following season, <laughs> uh, they had who would have been their fly off at the time left. Um, in 2012? Yeah. Wasn't um, that Flanagan, was it? No, no, no. It'd be, they are, oh, they had Jason Tovey. It would have been Tovey went to Cardiff. Oh, Tovey, yeah. Um, yeah. And so they were left with him and Arwell Robson, who is one of the greatest rugby players that I have seen uh, in my life. Um, <laughs> and they were left with those two kind of battling for the 10 shirt and neither of them kind of laid it down. And I think both of them ended up playing the championship a few years later. Of course. Yeah, Steph, so, Steph, Steph Jones was a good player. Good player, rated yeah. him. Good fun. As I say, Jay from the in-between his hair, which yeah. is now rare in a rugby player. Also, just searched him up, he had like a Fred Durst like soul patch as well. <laughs> yes. So, uh, on the wing then, who a player who I actually remember was Patrick Leach. Patrick Leach um, on the beach. Who did score this game, yeah. Played about 50 times for the Dragons. Good player. Great player. Really rated Patrick uh, Leach. <laughs> yeah. The centres are a bit weird, right? I, I don't know if you can guess who the outside centre is. Uh, Rodrigo Davis. No. Um, do you have a guess? Ooh, um, no, I don't. Okay, so the inside centre first was Lewis Robling. Oh, Which yes. sort of remember. No, it was... It was Lewis Robling was the other 10. Sorry, not Oliver Robson. Oliver Robson came after. It was Lewis Robling was the other one. Yeah. His dad well, I'm pretty was sure he's still on the or something. Maybe, too, maybe, or something like that. Oh, man. Lewis Robling. Decent player, Lewis Robling. Yeah, he's only 32. He was... He's played for Black Heath. Well. Wow. Yeah, was one of those players who... Um... Sort of got talked about a lot as a twenty-year-old or something, and then didn't quite make it at the Dragons, and eventually got let go. Um, yeah, I think early Bernard Jackman era. So, <laughs> scored a try in a win over the Ospreys in twenty twelve. It this was the that that was um like twenty days before this where they beat us twenty to twenty one oh, wow. twenty, um at Morganstone Brewery. If you know. Um, right partner. <laughs> Partner in oh, Lewis Robling was Andy Tualaki. Of course! Oh, wow. Of course! <laughs> <laughs> I remember Tualaki. my dad watching this game and describing it as like a Tualangi tribute act. <laughs> and Anatelia Tualagi played uh, in this game. He was at Dragons until. Yeah, he was there for two years. Played 42 times for the Dragons. I thought he was there for about three months. <laughs> yeah, same here. That's why I was like, I had to check. I was like, shit, he played 42 yeah, it, times. It screams like a short-term injury cover because they've yeah. like ran out of centres. So so where do you think he ended his career? Oh, geez, French third division? It was French third division. He played for Tarbe Pyrenees Rugby. Yes! One of those towns that when I was in France at the World Cup, you'd go by and you go, oh, I only I know they exist because I've seen them in the French league structure. Yeah. So and Andy Tualaki, I, I always forget, played like a good it's not even like played like three matches like JJ Engelbrecht. No, he genuinely <laughs> played like 42 times with the Dragons, and I cannot remember it whatsoever. So then at uh, on the other wing then was Will Harry's. Yes! Now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. Look, Will Harris. Look, this is the peak of good player for me. It's Will Harris yeah. and it's Tom Haberfield, two of my favorite players of all time. I love Will Harris and I miss him endlessly. Um, was from Bedford Blues originally. Yeah. Was um, most qualified, signed for the Dragons, 
Uh, I think made his. I can't remember. He made his debut one week, and his second game was against Saracens, and he scored two tries out of nowhere. And the Dragons won away at Saracens at the start of them being really good. And... Played for Wales Sevens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, of course that was it. It was Bedford Blues and Wales Sevens. Signed for the Dragons. Um, went on to win his first cap. Got called up by Wales in 2010 for the yeah. um, tour to New Zealand um, after yeah. Shane Williams got an injury. Um, when his first cap off the bench, then started against Australia that autumn um, and played perfectly well, you know, was good. Um, didn't get much opportunity. Then in the last minute, he went, or last few minutes, last three or four minutes, he went on this brilliant winding run. We beat Ashley Cooper, all ends up, uh, beat Matt Gitto, went inside out with Andrew Mitchell, kind of beat that legendary Australian back line and then, you know, got hauled down, whatever. Who cares? Uh, following week, um, there's this young kid who's fit again. So Wales decided to give him a go. That kid is called George North, and <laughs> Harry <laughs> finds himself dropped. And Harris would play for us once more, which is against the Barbars a few years later. Um, but I loved Will Harris. He was sort of Shane Williams in the way he glided around. He's one of those players that hit me at exactly the right age and forever one of my favorites. Like if I could create an all time like personal barbarians team, he's possibly in there. I love him and I could talk about him for hours as you're finding out right now. It's, it's a so, perfect quiz question for who is the winger that, that moved out of the way for George North, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's going to be a brilliant one in about 10 years time. There's people. There's going to be people over there scratching their heads and who it is. Who could it possibly be? This young that. winger who was being viewed as the future that summer. If he's and still then, oh boy, he um he went to Ealing after his. Um... He did, but he 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 was at also Chinna in he signed yeah, for Chinna yeah. afterwards, and I'm trying to find out if he's playing for Chinna <laughs> and the Nick Easter. I think he's retired now. Um, oh, that would be so good if he did. But for a long time, kept tabs on him and just hoped he'd come back. He's 37 now. so That's what I'm saying. He could still well be playing in China. Yeah. Um, now he's not. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> um, yeah, played for Ealing up until like 2019 when Ealing got a bit of money. So it was like, fair play. Hmm. So and then finally was Jamie Smith at fullback, oh, who yeah. was Irish. Um, it was the least Irish name ever. <laughs> um, was from Bali. He's a Belfast boy. Hmm. Um, so on the bench, said oh, very quickly. Will Harris is now a, a quantitative surveyor. So doesn't surprise Good me. for him. I hope uh, he glides Reece, around the um, quantities he's surveying. Reese Buckley. Uh, um, hooker, perfectly serviceable um, yeah. hooker, still only 34. Um, Aaron Condley, yes, Condley, vague man, Condley, that's the one, oh, Caffilly boy. Um, then you had Kieran, Kieran Jenkins, no memory whatsoever, yeah, only played like six times for the Dragons. Annie Hodge. Well, <laughs> no idea. Played one time for Britain. Yeah, this was his only game. For oh, the mate. Oh. Um, Josh Tyler. They were really scraping the barrel down here. Um, <laughs> really scraping the barrel. Jonathan Evans. Oh, good player. Jonathan Evans oh, was a good player. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. Solid player. Underrated. Um, yeah. uh, my granddad was once in the shop behind his um mum, um, because he's he's um, a Malik, my grandparents, and yeah. um, his mum was complaining to the lady at the checkout that he should be playing more for the dragons. <laughs> then you had Luke Williams at center again, only played twice, mm, no, and then Geraint O'Driscoll, yes, um, who had no Irish links, yeah. <laughs> He's like he's like the 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 millennial Gethro Callahan. Yeah, but Gethro Callahan, no offense, is probably a bit more talented. <laughs> um. So yeah, that was that was the dragons. That was peak bottom of the barrel dragons team. <laughs> uh, so now we get into a uh, uh, January twenty twelve Osprey squad. Now so, we're talking. There are two debuts in this game, as far as I can tell. Okay. 
Right. So, so Stefan Stephen, well. we've already talked about that. Stefan Watermeyer. Um Sam Davis was on the bench, wasn't he? Sam Davis was on the bench. Would Nipper this have been started. his debut? May I uh, no, Nipper played before this, didn't he? No, well, this has been Sam Davis's debut. Because Nip, yeah, Nipper, Maybe. Nipper had played a preseason game. We scored a hat trick and then played that game against Leicester that we talked about. Let me have a look. I have, the, I have the player record. Um, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, this was Sam Davis's. Debut. Oh yeah, so yes. There's another one who I didn't factor in actually. So I will come to him in a bit. Um, okay, so let's start. So at loose head, you had Kai Griffiths. Yeah, Mama, good player. Um, doing fantastic things at London Welsh um, whoops a lot of Swansea Uni as well mm. um, so Kenny Griffiths Scott Baldwin who would have been young-ish at this yeah. point um, 23 he would have been fringes of the Wales squad that's what I meant before that because he was quite a late developer Scott Baldwin and then um, obviously played at the 2015 World Cup played well at the 2015 World Cup actually yeah his um, first cap was the summer tour in Japan, um, yes. which would have been two years later. Yeah. And I think he'd kind of just broken the Ospreys team that season before he won his first cap. Mm. And then Aaron Jarvis, oh. tight head, good player. A classic. We, we go, I can't remember which episode it was, but go back into the archives and listen to those peak Aaron Jarvis chat <laughs> that we went into. Uh, Lloyd, he, no, he down as Lloyd Ashley here, but he was Lloyd Pierce. Mm. And always will be in my heart. Um, he is without a peer. Yeah, perfectly like serviceable club player, yeah. and I love him for it. Um, massive head, really big head. He would have been young at this point, actually. He oh, would have been. He like was twenty. Early 20. Yeah, yeah, he was twenty at this stage. He was yeah. So he would have been one of the... James Good partnered him in the second. Yes. Round. He was okay. He was okay. I I, I think I underrated James King for the first couple of years of his career because I sort of James Goode, who was fine, who was a perfectly decent like fourth or fifth choice lock. Went to Falcons, was from Whitchurch. I was oh. at Whitchurch the other day. Ended up playing for... I mean, he played for Manawatu in 2007, 2009. Wow. Oh, that was yeah. The Ospreys had a period of sending players yeah, out to the ITM. Yeah, they sent loads of players out to the ITM. Yeah, so Jonathan Spratt went and played in uh, New Zealand and a few others. Played for the Manawatu Turbos. Uh, I want to see the internationals. Who are their All Blacks? <laughs> Christian Cullen. Oh, well, oh yeah, okay. that's all right. Aaron, uh, future Ulster captain Aaron Cruden. Um, <laughs> uh, who else? Uh, who do I re- who do I recognise here? Uh, Nagan Lamape. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, he's he's up there with the greats. Um, <laughs> James James Good is in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I I, I, I can't remember him. I won't lie. I do tell you who I do remember: Chauncey O'Toole. Yes. Now we're I, talking. There was a. Um, piece on Wales Online before he signed for the Ospreys, calling him the best um, amateur player in the world, <laughs> and was <laughs> really being hyped up. And then signed for the Ospreys, bombed that one try, played this game where I think he was pretty good from my memory. Mm-hmm. And that was that was that. Um, Probably played what so like five or six games for the Ospreys. He played five games for us, and then was so shit he got sent on loan to Bridget. Oh. Um where he played three games of Bridget. Weirdly played <laughs> one game for Glasgow beforehand as well. Obviously, who we signed him from. Was he the um, best semi-pro player in the world, though? Yeah. <laughs> he, um... He... He, um... His previous... <laughs> played for RGC. Um, oh. uh, was last seen as a firefighter in... Oh, wow. In Canada, I think. Um... I can't remember what he looks like. Chauncey O'Toole. Oh, no, I remember. His, I would, if I walked past him in the street, I'd go, that's Chauncey O'Toole. It's one of these things that... I know, like, yes, I think you've got the same thing where things hit you at the right age and they'll be in your head forever. Well, he and, looks like a firefighter. 
you might not appreciate it now, but like with age, you realize like, oh, I don't remember half of my friends' names, but I remember everything about the Osprey squad from yeah. when I was 14. I don't remember half of my friends' names now. <laughs> on this. And, and one of them is Morgan Morse. And uh, <laughs> it's either that or the, or the fact that there wasn't any around when I was growing up. So maybe the Osprey squad did kind of take it's over. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, who knows? Common. Um, Sam Lewis at seven. He was good. Oh, yeah. Point. Uh, yes. Good player. Good player. Always loved that try against Connacht he set up, the Hassler one, where he makes a tackle on the blind side, like inexplicably gets the jackal and then gives it the gets it off to Hassler. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I saw that as well. Don't worry. Sam Lewis, yeah. Is he still at Hartbury? I think he's at Hartbury, isn't he? Oh, maybe. I'm pretty sure he's at Hartbury still. Could he... I mean, this championship, I think, yeah. So yeah. Hartford does sound right. So obviously he was at Worcester for a long time. And then Bristol. No, he played for Bristol for a bit, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, he, he did, yeah. He a little stint to Bristol, of course. Yeah. Went grey very early and looked suspiciously like um, Littlefinger off Game of Thrones. <laughs> Mainly in this photo, that I'm going to put the chat, and he does look a bit like Littlefinger. But also looks like Peter Romani, if you have to draw Peter Romani from memory. <laughs> yes, I can see that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how it's described. That's that's the best way to describe it. If, if you had to draw Peter Romani from memory, that's how I'm drawing. Yeah, I had two games for Bristol Bears. Oh, nine games for Bristol. Oh, nine games are. The, the, the yeah, it's Wikipedia's there. update. I checked two sources because I am a Sam Lewis stan. Of course, you know, brother of Ben Lewis, who's also a good player. Yeah. Uh, I was just to retire very tragically uh, early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was a yeah, good player. Hundred fifteen games for uh, Worcester in total. Forty one for the wow. Ospreys. Only forty one. Mm. He made his yeah, mark he, in those forty one, didn't he? Yeah, he was very good at them forty one games. Mm. Morgan Allen at eight. Still, still playing now. Yeah. Mm. Still going. Still trudging along. Scored a winning try against Gloucester for the Ospreys once. Did? Yeah. Could have used him this good, weekend. Good beard. Didn't he play for Ealing as well? Or am I making yeah. that up? Ooh, I think no, I think he might didn't he just go straight to Cardiff? I, I can't yeah, know. he did. He played for Ealing for a year. Wow. He um Yeah, played for Ealing. Obviously he was at the Scarlets then. Boo. Uh, and, and inexplicably had six appearances for West Wales Raiders uh, rugby oh, league. Oh yeah, team. yes, uh, I do remember that. Did you get? No, he didn't get Wales cap. Ten games for Wales under twenties though. Hmm. Uh, he <laughs> apparently he's he's related to Andy Allen, uh, his father, who played for Wales in nineteen ninety three times. Um, yeah, he played for Ealing. Yeah, he went from Carmarthen Quinns to Ealing and then to Bedwells mm. to Cardiff. And then where is he now, Yeston? Is he at Cardiff he's, still? Yeah, he's still at Cardiff. He's he's, uh, he was captain at the start of the season when they uh, headed the Sardis for their derby. But uh, I think he's still 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 playing as well this season. Yeah, good player. Mm. Uh, then uh, the mole at nine, Tom Haberfield. Oh, Man. we've got what both Will Harris and Tom Haverfield here. This is the best game of rugby that's ever been played. <laughs> My two favourite rugby players. It doesn't get any better than this. You know, I've got to pretend that I like, 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 you am or whatever. No, <laughs> if it was up to me, every single video would be about Will Harris and or Tom Haverfield. Um, 136 games to the Oscars, I'm pretty sure. Wow. Wow. Just... I'll never forget. He's still only 31, for fuck's sake. He could do wow. a job. Why aren't Cardiff picking him up? Why aren't the Ospreys Sh picking him up? Surely he's better than Matthew Aubrey. He is. He always has been. This is a, a topic of some ire for me. I never forget your 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 quip in, in that. I can't remember who was the first Ospreys video or one of the... I think it was it the Connor Murray one? 
where mm. you go like it, like you go to the most consistent scrum halves in the world, and it's like a flash that like really good scrum half, yeah. and then Hammerfield <laughs> pops up at the end, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, he's not wrong because I knew of your inexplicable love for him. Um, I have been sharing it myself. Yeah. Um, so, but it's like a joke that literally only the three thousand that turn up in the stadium can get. Yeah. <laughs> But like we would on the way down to um, Bristol every week, me and Will were running for our favorite, like not a favorite players 50, but players we most enjoy cheering for. And mm. that or a favorite players of all time team, like Haberfield is in there for me. Like, that'd be, I that'd be a good one. Him. We should do one of them. Yeah. That'd be a great, that'd be great fun. Yeah. Um, he may be even captain. You know, I love Tom Haberfield. He's one of my all time favorite players. I remember. It might have been that video. It might have been a similar one because I put a lot of Tom Haverfield references in early on in um, the yeah. Squid Rugby videos. Actually, bring it but back, I see. I know. <laughs> there was going to be one in the Gibson Park one, but then it just like got left out, which is a shame. Um, <laughs> going to rework the video in the final going up on Sunday to suddenly be entirely about Tom Haverfield and see if those South Africans still click on it. Um, I remember the one being like, someone saying like, I'm learning about the game a lot. And I was looking through these players and I recognized like, Brian Habana and I recognized uh, Johnny Wilkinson or whoever but I didn't recognize the third player and so I looked him up and I discovered ah it's a young scrum arc with Tom Haverfield and I'll keep an eye on him because he's clearly one of the most talented players in the world uh, and, uh, and that player grew up to be uh, Antoine Dupont <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then you had Nipper at 10 Andy Howell mm. must. Andy Howell was in the, the crowd here. Clearly, this is. Uh, I think one of the core Nipper texts is this. It's the other game at the Brewfield against um, yeah. Leicester. There was a handful of them where he absolutely now, carved up. He loved playing against the Dragons, is what I remember. Yeah, because you had that one where he went the length of the field, length of the field of Liberty as well, when Dragons were playing in that awful blue and black. Yes, yeah, mm. so that Osprey's back lane. Is really interesting as well. I'm pretty sure Bigger played the night at 12. Yeah. Memory serves me correctly. Wow. Um, Eli Walker on one wing would have been a young Eli Walker there. Yeah. Just before he caused havoc in Europe. Yeah. Scott, yeah. This, yeah, he, yeah. This was just oh. for Europe. You're right. Where he, he batted yeah. around to lose. 19 oh. years old. One good player. And then making his debut, Stefan Watermeyer. Oh. <laughs> A, a legend, a hero, a greatly underrated player, player I greatly enjoyed, scored a brilliant try. Um, also had a moment where I think he ripped the ball and got turnover and threw like a 50 meter pass off his wrong hand, um, wide and someone made a break off it. Probably, yeah, Walker or Dirksen. Um, spoilers. And I think it might have been Eli Walker. Eli Walker scored a try, didn't he? Yeah, he did score a try. I think it was his try, was Watermeyer ripping the ball off someone and then throwing it immediately wide to um, Walker, who was unmarked, because, you know. The hadn't been set up to defend, and then ran it in from there. Um, yeah, always wanted to see more of him. Never, never Do quite happened with the Ospreys. Why he was released from the Ospreys? No, no. I I remember the injury he suffered after scoring a brace against Cardiff. So he he scored a try in his debut and was named man of the match. Hmm. Um, but he was released because of the implementation of a salary cap. Oh. So that's why he was released and then joined the Pumas of the Greek. I can't remember. Greek was, yeah. And then the Pumas yeah. the season after. Wow. Um, so, yeah. With, with a salary cap. So, you know, shame we couldn't sign him on a central contract, eh? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he went. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because that. of a salary cap. Um, Partner him was a hundred and three year old Sonny Parker. Good player. Great Good player. player. We've said so much about Sonny Parker, but it's just becoming boring. Um Hannah Dirksen on the other wing. He would have been young Hannah Dirksen. Yeah. Um, obviously would go on to demolish Munster a few months later. And win the entire uh, league thing away at Leinster. Was that this or was that the year after? No, there was this year, 2012, wasn't there? Hmm. This was January 2012, so it would have been 2011, 2012. Yeah, it would have been this season. I'm yeah, oh, 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm being stupid. And then Ross yeah, Jones. Where's your central contract? <laughs> yeah, where's my central contract? Ross Jones at 15. Uh, two Irish qualified players at fullback. Because there was the infamous um, tug of war between the Ospreys and Connell for Ross Jones, who hadn't decided whether he wanted to play for Ireland or Wales. And in the end, it didn't matter. He ended up playing in the Super Six in Scotland, inexplicably. It did, actually. I think I follow him on Instagram, so I can't <laughs> keep up with it. Um, All of this is just of, in my head forever. Speaking of 103 year old players, Mavin Davis was on the bench. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> Jeez, I guess he retired this season. Loved that era of like, oh yeah, he was. He was thirty nine at the time, Mavin Davis. Yeah. Um, thirty nine year old Mavin Davis as a player coach, loved it. Uh, Joe Reese, yeah, on the bench. Sort Vague of memory of. was a Johnny Thomas. Yeah, to the prop. No, I no memory of Johnny Thomas. Sam Williams, remember him? I don't. I'm sure he played for the Whites a bit, Sam Williams. Mm. Oh, um, th- oh, Rory Pitt, Rory Pittman, big lads. Two separate players that got signed by the Scarlets, played a few games, got hyped up by the Welsh press, and then sort of disappeared to go and play in the Welsh Prem. Very at number big eight. Lad. Mm. Uh, played. I think he played that Christmas in the 2012, 2013 season hmm. against us. I think it was that year. Um, let me have a look. Pro... Oh, let's go on I think, it, like... yeah, it was. It was. Mm-hmm. He played against us. Um, Tom Grabham then was replacement to Scrum Half. Decent player. Kind of yeah. the pound shot at the top of the field. It's yeah. weird that the, both the nines could also do a shift on the wing as well. Mm. Didn't they um... have a brother? Oh, yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. Go back through um, open yeah. set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, played one game for the Scarlets in 2017, Tom Grab. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, against Bristol, maybe? Hmm. Um, debuts. So we the one we covered earlier, Sam Davis made his debut. Eighteen um, years old, I think. Eighteen years old. Nigel Davis's son, uh, Amanda's son as well. Don't don't forget Amanda Davis. A um, lot of hype around him. Um, you know, Stuart Barnes would go on to to glaze over <laughs> Sam Davis and his wand of a left boot. Um, probably never really fulfilled his potential, but was very much obviously unlucky to be stuck behind bigger. Um, yeah. and a very talented pool of tens as well, with the likes of um, Patchell, Priestland, uh, you know, early years of Anscum, but ah, oh, just such a good player, man. Still causing chaos in the Pro D do as well. Yeah, he's a tearing it up down there. And now has like apparent, apparently got the best gin in the world or something like that. I think he got voted. Yeah, um, so I haven't seen the drop goal from a couple of weeks ago. Just go and watch it. Because it's if you are looking at Sam, please send me some gin. <laughs> um so and also um say hi to Will Hickey for us. Yeah. <laughs> say hi to Will Hickey. Yeah, that's a deep cut joke. <laughs> but not many that's for the regular know. listeners. That is for the regulars. So, who do you think was at twenty? When was wearing twenty three and made his debut? So, it'd be a new one. Yeah. Uh, are they still at the Ospreys? They're still at the Ospreys right now. Okay. So, um, who this can, narrows it down. It, a so lot, it's an outside back. Yeah. So it's too early for Watkin. Um, it <laughs> couldn't was it Dan Edwards? Um, yeah. no, Dan Cassandra. Um, um, <laughs> tell you what, uh, no, because I remember Keelan Giles' debut was against Benetton years after this. Yeah, no, um, it's not, not Giles. was it? Was it a pre sevens Luke Morgan? That no, was pre sevens Luke Morgan. Wow, back when he just had pace, not sevens pace. Yeah, Ooh. so, well, so this was Luke Morgan's debut. 
Wow. Space. Now, all those years ago. And you forget how long he's been at the Ospreys because you forget he's an academy boy. Yeah. That just happened to go and play for Wales Sevens for like five years or whatever, six years. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Didn't get a yellow card. Disappointing. Oh, man. Um, obviously, he got a Wales cap. Um, mm. got his, he had a lot of hype in his Wales cap, right? And then they yeah. never passed him the ball. Yeah, that was a weird. Yeah, because my mother, we were discussing international players a couple of days ago. Me and my mother, and she's a really big Luke Morgan fan for whatever reason. And He's handsome lad, very handsome lad. Potentially, and for some reason, my mother's got some sort of weird phobia of wingers cutting inside off the wing. I don't know why. And <laughs> yeah, but um, but th- this conversation ravels on about internationals and the Ospreys camp. And I am saying, oh yeah, Luke Morgan, there's there's another international for you. And her jaw dropped because and then I just remembered his debut, thinking he had about an hour of sixty-five minutes against Scotland. And he rarely did it, I did he even have a touch. I think he touched I, the ball yeah, once. once. And it was like yeah. carrying the ball back in his yeah. own twenty two and dotting it down for a dropout. It like, was depressing. A, a weird debut after a really good run of form in the build up. Yeah. Uh, has had nine yellow cards for the Ospreys, by the way, and one red card. <laughs> but uh, so his yeah. run before that Wales debut was four tries and five starts. Yeah. Which is not bad. Which wouldn't even get you a look in at the Wales squad at the minute. No, and not if you play for the Ospreys. If you play for the Scarlets, no, well, you're well, automatically if starting. You were, if, you, if you were 12 years old and played to Cardiff, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, is about to make his 100th appearance. Uh, oh. if, he plays, if he plays. Uh, he's got two games to 100. He's a 98 caps at the minute, oh, which obviously on... you know doesn't travel for now. So 25, 24 tries. So he's just 14 behind Sam Parry <laughs> in just well, two games. No, he's what three games fewer than Sam Parry. Yeah. No. Yeah. What? Yeah. Two games fewer than Sam Parry, and <laughs> he's got 14 fewer tries. As a reasonably Absolutely. prolific winger. Uh, so yeah, um, that's that's possibly the most niche good player we've done. Is an <laughs> LD remember, Cup I, game from January twenty thirteen. I greatly enjoyed it, and I don't see, don't think Rob has ever been more happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is my element. Um, we come back previous week. We'd lost 24-14 to Worcester Warriors. Well, you see, I looked I looked at doing the EDF um, energy uh, or the, the Anglo-Welsh from 2008-2009, but we were just really good and we were just beating everyone. <laughs> so I thought, oh, shit, 2007-2008, sorry. So I thought, oh, that'd be a bit boring, actually. Um, you want the list of players we release in order to avoid the salary cap at the end of that season? Yes, please. Here's a, here's a blast from the past for you. So there's a few, right? So Matt Torrance, no real memory of. Um, ben Thomas, not that one. Um, no, no memory not of. that one. Trey Cross, Ken Dowding, who sounds like a Tory politician from the 90s. Yeah. Um, and then we start to get into the names, right? So Di Flanagan. Oh, yeah, Di Flanagan was still there, yeah. Cut for salary cap reasons. Rory Big Pittman. Yeah, we knew yeah. that. Went to the Scarlet. Um, Went to the Scarlets. Barry Davis, one yeah. cap wonder. Who... Uh, what was his nickname? 18 months, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it one and a half years. Um, he was, yeah, good, good player, Barry Davis. Good Great fullback, player. yeah, yeah. yeah. Good fullback. Really solid second choice. I, Blue Bird. Really synonymous with that um, blue, uh, black and blue kit we had. Yeah, yeah. Um, my dad would always talk about how many times he played really well for Wales, despite the fact he got one cap off the bench. And no idea what he was imagining there. Um, no idea what he'd made up, but you know, um, I've wondered that many times since. Um, Chauncey O'Toole, yeah, Stefan Watermeyer, tragically, yeah, and Gareth Owen. Oh, another what could have been ended yeah. up as a bit of a journeyman, went to Scarlets, went to Leicester, where I think his career ended with a red card against maybe Northampton during that really. 
Well, when he, didn't he like bulk up and become like a really decently bulky 12? Yeah, he became like a big 12, like boshy 12 for Leicester. 12, and I'm like, where did this come from? Like, came out of nowhere. Yeah. What but was the... um? So, <laughs> Gareth Owen um, was compared to Gavin Henson by Scott Johnson, infamously, uh, because he had olive skin and could play a variety of positions in the back line. Um, which were why Scott Johnson said it. Uh, he mentioned his olive skin in the thing. Um, and then after a preseason game against it. Leeds, which is another game we'll have to do because I have a signed team sheet of that on my wall at my mum's. Um, <laughs> went round. <laughs> you like, to your mum's and get it. Yeah. The Ospreys squad was sat a few rows behind us. So we went round and, like, me and Will got our team sheet signed. We were maybe 12, 13. Um, signed by the full squads. There's like Tommy Bow, there's Shane Williams, there's Jerry Collins, his first season there. There were all sorts. Um, but yeah, after that game, we've been man of the match, Gareth Owen. He tweeted something like, Next Wales 12, you're looking at him. <laughs> um, then got released that season. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of him at Leicester. Mm. Uh, difference between him at Ospreys and him at Leicester. I was always, he was at Falcons as well, wasn't he? Oh. Yeah, he became a very bulky 12. So, cool. Right, let's very quickly talk Stormers. Um, mm. We predict rotation, definitely, in certain positions. Um, but maybe just be like, fuck it, we need league points. Um, who got released in like different seasons in my head now? Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely fine. Um, oh, yeah, so I, I don't know what to think of it. it it's just going to be um, different. Mm. From the way Booth talked about it and then Cuthbert talked about it, the priority feels a four-try bonus point as a realistic yeah. target has happened against... It was the Bulls last season, wasn't it? Where they went out and mm. walked, came home with that. Um, just picking up some points in order to stay in the hunt. Um, again, the URC supercomputer projected that we're going to need 49 points to get in. Uh, they're currently on 35. So if you're looking at wins against Cardiff and the Dragons as realistic, you know, wins, you're looking at needing three or four points out of these games against um, the Bulls, the Stormers and Leinster which is the, the tricky one, or you're hoping that, you know, Ulster and Benetton and so on start to slip up more and more? Well, we need Cardiff to be actually confident this week. Yeah. So, if they can get over their troubles and make it all incredibly proud, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. But the rumours of Tolupe Falata coming back might make mm. that possible. That, that, that'd be that's amazing. That's true, yeah. A real boost for Cardiff, that. Um, but yeah, if we do manage to get... Um, Jack Morgan or Dewey Lake back that'd be huge but I'm kind of expecting a changed and younger team as we've talked about for both emotional reasons as well as for fitness reasons a lot of these players have played an awful lot of rugby um, I feel like Dan Edwards might get a go at 10 um, I think we might see a few of the you know perhaps Morgan Morse might get a run out um, Lewis Lloyd a few of these younger players who have stepped up really well might get another chance to prove themselves and see how they can do and our defense has improved massively over the last year. And last year we scored four tries and then just fell off enough that, you know, led in what, four or five um, during those games away in South Africa late on. And yeah. if they can just maybe keep out one or two of those tries, they can potentially be in the hunt to pick up two points or even more um, late on, which has got to be the goal. Yeah, I, I can't argue with that. Um <laughs> If Stormers score a lot of tries, it's fine. Man, Liverpool kick them anyway. Um, so, you know, we can stay in the hunt. Also worth noting as well, the Stormers have a bit of an injury crisis going on. Um, yeah. And they did not have many players left at the end when they scored that try to, you know, they missed the conversion against La Rochelle. But, yeah, they they have some injuries. This might be a decent time to play them, um, to line it mm. up. But also, they are very much targeting the league. This is their goal. This is all they're about. And they're really up for it. I'm trying to think. I, 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 um, 
yeah, four chain bonus point has to be the has to be the mm. like target. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just seeing who we signed in 2013, 2014. <laughs> Go on. Um, so we signed. This is a really mixed bag. Uh, Tyler Ardron, good player. Mm-hmm. Um, Matthew Dwyer, um, Sam Williams, who was Aberavon, not uh, Swansea. Yeah, uh, the, the name clicks now. Uh, I kind of got who it was. Bridgend. Was he yeah. the one that played for Germany? Yes, former Wait. Pompey player. He follows me on Twitter, weirdly. Um, yeah. yeah. I see Isn't he the yeah. Murphy man on Twitter? That's always stuck with yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but you might <laughs> be right. Uh, Tito Tabaldi, Jeff Hassler. Oh, man. That was a, That's a mixed bag. Yeah, for transfers. Players. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> right. Sorry, I got distracted again. Um, Stormers, let's go get a try bonus point and be somewhat competent, please. And actually, you know, go at them in the line out. Um, let's play to our strengths. Let's just go out, have some fun. Aim for that one or two points if we can. Obviously, we want to aim for the win, but, you know. Getting just points out of South Africa is is what we have to do. We've yeah. got the monkey off our back in terms of winning in South Africa. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be tough. I, um, I wonder if it might be a really good game for this team to have immediately after the quarterfinal, where yeah. there is no pressure on them whatsoever. You know, if they're coming into a game against the Dragons where they're expected to win. Um, or, you know, the get judgment day, which is another big game they've got to get themselves up for, that may be more difficult even into a semi final, where you could see that I think there was the weight of the previous few weeks had weighed on them a bit. And coming into two or three games back to back, where they're not expected to get a result with a week off in the middle, might be really good for this team kind of rejuvenating themselves and building towards that end of the season. Um, and particularly to say, if you can potentially, you know, this is a. Um, a Stormers team that are missing some key players with injuries. Uh, you know, Daimani picked up an injury last time. Um, and there's a chance, you know, the um, there's a like Springbok alignment camp as well that I think is coming up. So there's a you chance some so. of those players might be, you know, the La Box mm. of the world, Willemses might not play, um, yeah. which would be a bonus. And maybe if the Stormers can be softened up slightly, you can potentially get into them a bit. I, I I think we can get in some anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I genuinely think so. You know, we what was the last result with them? We drew with them, wasn't it? 16 yeah. no, no after a Stephen Myler conversion, after a Scott Bolden, Willie Mull try. That sounds... He's, that was a weird Friday night game. That was, that was an awful was. game. That was, that was a PRD ref uh, game. Oh, of course it Yes, was. he was, yeah. Paul DeWitt ironically scored the first try of the night. It game. was so gay. Which was... Oh, that was... That was a oh yeah. He oh. banged like a fifty meter pound in the rain. It was glorious. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a weird, weird. Fr- yeah, yeah. That's, that was a strange Friday night. That was a awful Friday night. Um, right. So I think that's everything. Um, I think we got way too carried away on that good play, and I absolutely love it. <laughs> I think I feel like we've gone back to peak good play. And, um, I'm definitely LV Cup might be my new hunting ground. <laughs> that and preseason games. Oh, the, there's such gold in preseason games, man, out there. Yeah, not at the time, but afterwards. No, God no. Um, so that's us. We, hmm. uh, I'm not going to be here now for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um. So I will. By the time this go, uh, by the time next week happens, I will have uh, had the baby. Um. So I'm going to be taking a break. Uh. From the diary. The uh, the pod will continue with the, the capable hands of the boys. I will still record it for them um, and various other things. Um, but uh, yeah, we we I'll still be on the Twitter and doing all that stuff. But uh, you won't see you won't see or hear me on the pod. Um, thank you to all the, the people who reached out, kind messages. You know, it does mean a lot. Uh, I think we've built a really great community uh, here, here at this podcast. So, yeah, bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, I'll see you when I do. Um, I'll, I may be training them back for the, uh, the Welsh Derbies if everything goes smoothly. Um, but from me and the boys, you can find us all on the regular socials, and we shall see you very soon. Goodbye, Ned.
beautiful 